Hey gang, it is Wednesday. You know what that means? It's Hump Day. Hump Day. Hump Day. Day. Hump, Day. Hump, Day. Hump Day. Hump Day. Hump Day. JB, come on. It's Hump Day Happy Hour with Dennis in the know. This is your backstage pass for current trends, politics, and education in the dental world. It is live, as always. It is over a delicious cocktail, something I might have had one too many of in Las Vegas this weekend, but that's a story for another time, perhaps. We'll talk about that later. What happens doesn't always be, I'm just going to say. Anyway, we are all practicing dentists, and when I say we, I am talking about my amigos, Dr. Chad Duplantis and Dr. Jennifer Bell. We are all practicing dentists. And we are all business owners, as well as educators. And our job is to bring all of you in the know. Uh, it's been an interesting week. Obviously, yesterday was election day. And I'm sure most of you have heard, but the question two on the Massachusetts ballot passed actually pretty handedly at 70% of the vote uh, going in favor of question two, um, which was a little bit of a someone coined today, David and Goliath story. There was a lot of money coming in in opposition of that particular um, item on the ballot from large corporations and obviously um, insurance providers wanting that to not be passed. So it will be interesting to see. Uh, I think several things may come from this. One, uh, certain insurance companies that are very much not operating within those parameters may have to uh, take a hard look at the books and figure out how they're going to reinvest back into patients. Um, the other thing that will be interesting is if other states will take a cue, um, especially because of how much attention. There were two other states that actually had passed this within the last couple of years. But for some reason, the Massachusetts one really got a lot more traction. And with the support of the ADA uh, and other organizations really coming out boldly with a lot of financial support, um, it will be interesting to see if other states take up the cause to add that to their ballots in the upcoming election in 2024. So we'll keep posted if we, we hear any traction gaining from other states or, you know, if you want to work with your local legislators to consider bringing that forward to mirror what happened in, in Massachusetts. I would say there's definitely some opportunity for improvement in that particular language. So maybe let the dust settle a little bit and see how that actually forms into applicable law. In addition, uh, the, there is now, we talked about this actually back in May of this year, the ADA was looking at the CDT code conglomerate. Um, every year they have a CDT code group that looks at the codes and makes recommendations for modifications. They might add a different level of uh, procedure code. They might tweak something. They might add a new procedure code. Uh, sleep has been a popular area in which we've seen newer codes starting to show up in the CDT code book. So that's a very standard process that happens on an annual basis. But in addition to that, they have a committee now who's tasked with looking at the CDT in an enhanced way. Uh, I think it's going to mirror a lot more like medicine and medical coding. They state that the CDT codes as they exist with the D and the four digit code afterwards, that will stay in place. Um, but they're looking specifically at modifiers, which if you do any medical coding at all, you'll be familiar with that. Um, and those modifiers are really intended to start getting very granular on the type of dentistry we're doing. So, for instance, if you do a restorative procedure with a handpiece versus a restorative procedure with a laser, you might choose a different modifier for that particular code. Um, if you use a 3D printed crown versus a milled crown, you might choose a different modifier for that full coverage restoration. So that's the granularity that they're looking into to get more specifics. There's a lot of reasons why they want to gather that information, obviously from a data collection standpoint, they'll understand a lot better the practice of dentistry and what it really looks like, uh, what doctors are really doing on a day-to-day -day basis. I think there's always the risk and concern that folks have of the unintended consequences of these particular changes and how it will impact how insurances look at us, what reimbursements they'll disqualify based on whether or not we're using certain technologies or not. 
It also will continue to enhance whether or not they require us to use certain technologies or techniques um, when we're doing de different dental procedures. So, you know, these are the things that I think warrant additional discussion. So the ADA now has a five month open comment period. I'll post the links tomorrow. I really encourage you to look through this very carefully. Um, they have a couple Q&A sessions. I'll post those dates as well if you want to sit and listen to a small presentation about what they're currently looking to do and how they're looking to modify the CDT code book um, and give everyone an opportunity who has any vested interest in this to express their comments um, related to the changes that are coming. This is a five month period. So if you feel passionate about getting paid for what you do every day, I would definitely take an opportunity to educate yourself. I don't really think this is a discussion of whether or not these are going to happen. I think that ship may have sailed. So now we're at least part of the participating group um, to give open comment about how to make it the most effective and better understand what some of the unintended consequences may be. Major organizations are watching this as well, providing ample feedback on whether or not they think different changes are warranted or necessary. But the individual dentist can certainly provide feedback as well. So I would encourage you to do that. I will post a lot of information on that tomorrow so that you can click and go straight to it and educate yourself because that's a big topic for us. The ADA also put out their state of dental economy, their Q3 report. They've been doing this really consistently for the last couple of years. I've mentioned it on a routine basis here at Dinks because I think it gives a really, it's the only place currently that I know of where you can go and get a broad overview of what the state of dentistry is looking like pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and now post-pandemic, which has been a very rocky kind of bounce back. And there were some interesting changes that occurred in Q3 from Q2. One, it seems like the data that they're collecting, and they interview about 1,200 dentists, so it's a sample population throughout the U.S. It looks like among those dentists that a little bit of easing is happening in the, in the staffing world. So there's a question they ask about, are you open and not seeing patients because you don't have enough staff, patients aren't calling to book appointments, they're canceling last minute, or they're no-showing, those particular type of statistics are tracking. The staff shortage piece being the reason why we can't see patients seems to be easing a little bit. It had been on a pretty good trajectory for quite some time. This is the first downtick that you're starting to see on the graph, which may be an indication either we've stopped looking or they're filling enough necessary positions to keep the schedule full or getting more creative in the way they're utilizing their current team members to manage the schedule. Maybe assisted hygiene, for instance, or advancement of a DA1 to a DA2 by in-office training, et cetera. Um, but the number of patients just not calling to book appointments or not recapturing on those treatment plan presentations is going up. So it does seem like, in general, still the busyness of the doctors have not reached back to pre-pandemic level. We're still about 9% below where we were before um, the Q1 of 2020. So, you know, that is a concern. The other thing that came out that continues to be challenging, and, and I just don't know how it's going to play out, is that the data that was collected also showed that most dentists are continuing to show increases in laboratory costs, rent, um, staffing costs and dental material expenses uh, related to providing patient care. But for the first time, this was much larger than what I saw out of the Q2 report. Almost 90% of dentists of the sample population report no change or a decrease in their fee reimbursement schedule. In fact, one in four dentists have reported that their insurance company has dropped their reimbursement rates in Q3. That is extremely concerning. You've got these two compounding issues heading toward this sort of collision course where the profit margin of a dental practice is getting uh, fairly compromised while we're trying to kind of renegotiate out of the pandemic uh, hit that most small businesses had, staffing increased costs or not being able to find enough. And if doctors are going to start seeing decreases in reimbursement from insurance companies, this is going to be a pretty difficult challenge for most practices to overcome. In fact, as we mentioned before, for really the first, not the first time in history, but a pretty marked uh, time that hasn't repeated very often in the history of dentistry in the U.S., 
as they've been tracking the data against inflationary rates. While the rate of inflation in the U.S. still stays around 8.2%, we did have a slight downturn uh, last month. The rate for, for inflation uh, in dentistry is only at 4.1%. So that's a pretty key reflection of the fees not being able to adjust high enough to compensate for the economic inflation trajectory in the U.S. So, you know, I'm glad the ADA continues to collect this data. I think we need to continue to stay educated about the the state of our profession, creative ways that we can be uh, nimble. Uh, I think it's going to force doctors to be um, creative, hopefully within the law, of how they run their practices, how they maximize the staff they currently have, how they manage their overhead and expenses. Do they stay in network or not? I think these are all really interesting questions. I worry long term, not as much about the dentist, but about the quality uh, and access to patient care, because I think if doctors have to make these types of adjustments and rightfully so, I might add, um, the number of doctors who will be able to see patients will the number of available appointments will certainly uh, take a hit. So not to be Debbie Downer, you know, we're coming off an election. I think there, there's a lot of um, views into 2023 and what hopefully economic outlooks will look like. Um, but I do think, you know, batten hatches and be prepared for um, adjustments as needed. And with that, little ray of sunshine is done with the news yet again. I'm excited about tonight's guest. Chad, would you like to introduce Dr. Carter? I, I would. So a few months ago, um, Dr. Partha Mukherjee asked me if we had ever thought of having a pathologist on the show. And I was like, that sounds like a pretty fantastic idea. So anyhow, uh, fast forward. And we ended up speaking with Dr. Ashley Clark, and she agreed to come on the show. Dr. Ashley Clark is currently serving as the interim dean, uh, interim associate dean for uh, academic affairs and the division chief of oral pathology at the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, she is on the professional board for oral cancer cause and digital dental notes. She's won several teaching awards. She's provided over a hundred continuing education courses. And I think that number is growing daily based upon her social media posts. Um, she lectures nationally, internationally, and she's lecture and she's authored over 40 publications and book chapters. So without further ado, she's been waiting long enough. Should we just leave her down there? Okay, we'll let her on. Dr. Ashley Clark, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's so awesome to have you. So my first question is, how did you get into pathology? The glamour. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right, You're right for the jugular. <laughs> I was like, I heard that. How long yeah. could I wait to make a joke about it? The answer was five seconds. Um, so in dental school, I quickly learned that I could not do dentistry. Um, it was it was pretty evident, and I just panicked and thought, I'm gonna have to go to med school. Um, and then I took my first oral pathology class and I went down, his name was Dr. Nadim Islam. And I said, I need you to help me do what you do. And he said, everybody hates dentistry in the first couple of years. Like go see some patients and then come back to me if you still want to do it. You, but you need to get through your third year and then you'll probably still want to be a dentist. Um, and then the very last day of my third year, I went to his office and I said, help me do what you do. And he did. I ended up going to the same residency that uh, he did. And thank God I could not do anything else. Uh, I was you know, I'm still close with some of my old professors and they're very happy with my self-awareness <laughs> that I was not very good at dentistry. I tried my, my best. Well, you know, um, it's funny. I, 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 I hate to say this post-mortem, but you just mentioned that my faculty advisor and one of my mentors in dental school had just passed. Yeah, but good. when I, when I interviewed for dental school, I actually interviewed with Dr. Stan McGuff. And then he became my faculty advisor when I got into dental school. And I was like, I don't want to be a pathologist. This guy is really boring. But it turned out he was incredibly, it, it, I mean, obviously incredibly smart. 
but you just have such a personality. I mean, do you ever feel like you're kind of trapped doing what you're doing or do you just, do you just love it and find so much joy in it? So I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, when I get to teach, I get to be like, the center of attention and like yeah. the expert in something. And that just like really makes my ego happy. <laughs> so I, I like it, but I, I will, you know, again, I do have the self-awareness to know that um, some pathologists be weird and that that's just how it is. Um, some dentists be weird. So. Yeah, that's I mean, just, just part part of it. Um, and I'm is. weird, so I I fit in with the pathology world well. But no, I I really, in all seriousness, I I honestly cannot believe how lucky I am that this opportunity for this career kind of came into my life because I do love it so so much. And I think a lot of pathologists are like that. That's why we don't retire till we're like 85. Um, and plus it's not as hard on the body as, as yeah. dentistry is. So what kind of training after dental school did you have to do? Because I think that's something that people just really don't understand. So for pathology, it is a three year residency. Um, and there's about 10 to 15 residencies taking applications at any given time. Um, and it's a little bit unique. So some of the hospitals are GME have GME funding. So we get, we can get paid during residency. Whereas for other specialties, you have to pay. Um, but the thing about oral pathology, which I always warn my students who want to go into it, because I want them to have like a clear head about it is that I oftentimes don't get to pick where I'm going to live. Um, because you 90% of us work in dental schools. So if there's an opening at dental school, that's where you got to go. Um, and I've been incredibly just lucky is the only word. Like I didn't work hard for the, it's just luck that I have been given the opportunity to move back to Indianapolis, which is, you know, sort of where I consider home. So, um, that's, that's way more information than what you asked for, <laughs> but it's three no. years. Three years. Hence another reason to love people from the Midwest. This is what I preach are my favorite people are from the Midwest. Why, Jeff? They're just they're just down to earth, salt of the earth people. They're just and they're fun to be around. Like I already I already know this 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 is going to be fun and we're going to do a lot with this because she's from I mean, Kentucky, I Jeff. She's no from matter, the south. What? Am I going in and out? No, I said she's from Kentucky. She's from the south. Let's get that I, clear. Yeah, I lived in Texas. Yeah. So oh, I no. Dr. McCurgy. But she's, you, a, she's a you Houstonian. Said, you said that you're from Indianapolis. Yeah, I do. I do consider Indianapolis my home. I grew up in a small town of of Southern Indiana. Yeah. Never mind. You're okay. from Midwest. Midwest. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Just lost yeah. a lot of respect for you. But carry on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. But anyway, what I'm what I'm saying is is how important this is to all of us. So it was one of the things that I realized early in dental school too. We had um. You probably know the name Brad Neville at at the Medical University. He's authored some some chapters and and he's her done chap some stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Um, I mean, but it's so important to know this stuff. I mean, those are the questions that people come in in a panic, like into your office, like, oh my god, what is this? Oh my god, what is this? Fixing teeth is easy, diagnosis is not, and so learning and what I hope to get out of this conversation tonight is, is the, the appropriate steps to take. When is radiology indicated? When is, um, when is a brush biopsy indicated? When do we wait and watch? When do we make an immediate referral for an incisional biopsy? I mean, I think these are really important, basic questions for, especially for newer dentists to say, because it really catches us by surprise when someone walks in the office and, and has something like, you know, you don't want to go, damn, what's that? You know, I mean, but it, it, it does. And, and so understanding, you know, a, a basic way to kind of make a differential diagnosis and then somehow get it to you, maybe you could share some insight on, on some of those things. Yeah, sure. So I would say, um, you know, I was sort of taught the two week rule. 
You know, you see something you don't like, bring them back in two weeks if it's still there, biopsy. So the first thing, um, I guess, is that's no longer what we teach. So what we teach now is if you see something and you don't like the way it looks, you should refer it for biopsy that day. Or if you do your own biopsies, do one that day. Uh, I would say the exception to that is if you think something's like an aphthous ulcer. Um, then you can recall them in two weeks. But in general, if you see leukoplakia, don't wait two weeks. That needs a biopsy. Um, the next thing I would say is as far as brush versus scalpel. So, and I, I'm giving all this information based on this article that was put out in JADA in October of 2017, where they did a huge evidence-based thing with lots of different specialists, and they came up with this flow chart. So that was the first thing they said is we're not waiting two weeks anymore. We're immediately referring. Um, but scalpel biopsy is prefer preferable every single time. So what the, the first thing you want to say is we need a scalpel biopsy. I'm going to send you to the surgeon or I'm going to do it myself. And if the patient adamantly refuses, then you can offer a brush biopsy. So uh, I want to clear up some terminology here. Sometimes when people say brush biopsy, they're thinking of exfoliative cytology, where we just take like the top layer and we're looking for yeast or something. But like like oral up, CDX or something. So that's a, a true brush biopsy, oral yeah, CDX. Yeah. So a true because brush it, biopsy is like you it get it It cuts and gets the depth of it. Correct? Yeah, you're actually getting exactly. into the beyond, beyond the epithelial layer. Exactly right. Yeah. You have to twist it until it bleeds. And that's one thing right. I ask my students, like, why do we have to twist till it bleeds? Well, that's how you know you've gotten through the epithelium. All the layers are on the brush and you're in the connective tissue. So what that can do is tell you yes or no. So yes, there's weird cells here. No, there aren't. So that can tell you if you really do need a scalpel biopsy. It can't diagnose it. Like you can't do a brush biopsy and get back a diagnosis of cancer, but you can do a brush biopsy and get back a diagnosis of you really need to take a biopsy of this. So for those of you who do your own biopsies, I do incisional biopsies when I'm trying to make a diagnosis so I can get my treatment plan. Uh, so for example, leukoplakia, if you have a centimeter long leukoplakia, you don't want to cut that all out right at first because we don't know the diagnosis yet. And depending on our differential, there's different ways to treat what the diagnosis could be. So you want to take a small bit of it. You know, you don't want to take out their entire tongue if it was benign hyperkeratosis. Right. And alternatively, if it was cancer, you probably didn't take enough and just ruined the margins for your surgeon. So incisional biopsy, if you're trying to establish diagnosis. Um, so I, I do, I did remember to say this. I, I, this is something I wanted to talk about. So I'm a big believer in diagnosing and then treating, which sounds silly and simple, but a lot of us uh, treat and then diagnose. So for example, if you have a patient who has multiple ulcers, widespread in their mouth, not resolving, getting worse, steroids is going to fix it almost every single time. So there's a really big temptation to just give steroids because that's going to make those ulcers go away. But what you need to do is diagnose what condition they have first and then give the steroids. Um, and the reason you shouldn't give the steroids first um, is number one, we, have, we haven't diagnosed it yet. But number two, um, most of these autoimmune diseases like pemphigus, pemphigoid, those require something called a direct immunofluorescent test to diagnose. And they will be false negative if you give a steroid before you do the biopsy. And I find that that's something that's not really taught in school. Um, and I know a lot of surgeons that don't know that. I know a lot of periodontists that don't know that because they've just never been taught that. So um, if you're doing any type of biopsy for direct immunofluorescence, if you're suspecting pemphigus or pemphigoid, uh, make sure the tissue is in the bottle before you give the steroids. I, I, I love this because I think this brings up a whole other layer for us in, in, in the trenches that are seeing these lesions as to how we communicate with patients. Because, you know, I've always said that a brush biopsy, I've stopped doing them. Um, and I think it's because I've been in practice so long, but it, a brush biopsy is to me is always kind of a starting point. It's basically a, yes, you have something going on and yes, you need to go for further treatment. So I'm referring them out anyways. 
But once you build that trust with your patients, I think I, I love what you said, because an incisional biopsy is going to give us the best diagnosis that we could possibly have prior to determining definitive treatment. And so I, I've, I've just come to the point where if I see things, I have these difficult conversations because they are difficult conversations with patients and tell them you need a biopsy. And a lot of times it scares the crap out of them, mm -hmm. but maybe it gets them to quit smoking and maybe it gets them to quit dipping and maybe it gets them to at least taper the drinking, you know, whatever it is, it, it, it motivates them to maybe make a change that's beneficial to them, regardless of the final outcome. Yeah. So I think also another point is for me, at least, um, if you do a brush biopsy, you're charging the patient for your time and expertise in doing that. And then the lab is charging the read and all you're getting is a yes or no. And they're going to have to redo that biopsy anyway with a scalpel. And then you're charging again. They have to take off another half day of work. Then, you know, I'm charging to read it. So there's a lot of extra costs associated if you do that brush biopsy step and don't go straight to scalpel too. And it, it basically just shows dysplastic tissue, correct? So it'll say it, it's basically a yes or no. Yeah. Like, yes, there are weird cells here or no, there aren't. So um, some surgeons prefer to watch mild dysplasia, like, hey, let's stop smoking and see if it goes away. Um, if it's moderate dysplasia or worse, the standard of care is all that tissue has to come out. So one of the issues with a brush biopsy is it can't tell you if it's mild dysplasia or moderate dysplasia. So it can't help you with the treatment plan, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Ashley, one of Do our Do you viewers... see... Um... No, go ahead, Jennifer, please. Uh, well, poor Jeff, his internet is laggy. Um, the, I had two follow-up questions. One, is there a time period, let's say a patient is erroneously treated with steroids for one of the uh, autoimmune lesions, is there a time period in which we can rebound from that and, and get a, should we wait a certain time period to go back and try to do the biopsy? And then the second one is if we could talk a little bit about the scalpel versus laser biopsies and, and what you see under the microscope. And for those doctors who are or would like to use their laser, they're just, you know, helpful tips to try to make that as diagnostic as possible. Yes. So thank you for asking that. That's very important. Uh, it's a three week steroid holiday. Okay. Um, you can probably get by with two, but um, I prefer three. And because I've seen uh, what we're looking at with direct immunofluorescence and not all pathologists do direct immunofluorescence. So before you do a biopsy, you need to drop it in Michelle's solution, not formalin, which is what 99% of the, you know, normally it goes into formalin. Um, so make sure they have the capability of doing direct immunofluorescence. But I've seen ones where patients are off steroids for two weeks and it, it's so, it's like, I'll call it, but it's really, really a weak signal and we want to see a more strong signal. So I prefer three. As far as scalpel versus uh, laser. So it depends on what you're biopsying. If it is a white lesion and you're trying to get a diagnosis on the epithelium, don't use a laser because what happens is the tissue gets burnt. And if it's a fibroma, I don't care if there's thermal artifact on the edge of the fibroma because there's enough in the center where it, do, it just doesn't matter. But if you're looking to grade a dysplasia, for example, um, that very top layer of epithelium it does get altered with the heat from the laser. So that, that's what I would recommend. If it's a mass, laser's fine. If it's a, a white lesion or a red lesion and you're trying to rule out dysplasia or cancer, go in with cold steel. And I saw, so I, I'm going to just uh, act like a moderator here. I saw another yeah. question. I think, Jeff, this is what you were going to ask me, right? So um, how do you feel about a punch versus a scalpel? So I have been taught my entire life scalpels better and you go in with a wedge and you take out a wedge. And I don't like that actually, because it's really hard to gross and get a really flat plane from a triangle. Um, with a punch biopsy, I can cut it and get a perfectly flat plane. So I actually love punch biopsies. 
And when I uh, did biopsies in my private practice, I I don't want to say exclusively because there were some, you know, like palatal you can't reach, but pretty much exclusively did punch biopsies. Uh, I just felt more, most, you know, I think I've discussed how my hand skills aren't the greatest. So I felt most comfortable with that. But I also like the way it's easy for me to gross the specimen and the histo technician can more easily orient it properly on the slide. Um, as far as the size of punch, probably four millimeters is sufficient. Um, and another thing is if you're biopsying something, I don't need to see normal. Um, and that's a big misconception too. Like, isn't that like what, what everyone's taught is get half normal, half yeah. not normal. I don't need to see it normal. Um, my coworker and I were like, we know what normal looks like. We want to see what's going on over there. Uh, but the exception to that would be if it's an ulcer. So with an ulcer, you have to get half normal, half ulcer, uh, because the top of the ulcer is just dead tissue and we can't tell what it is. Um, but if it's a cancer, it will be diving underneath the normal tissue and like pushing it up. So if it's an ulcer, I get half and half. And if it's an ulcer where you're trying to rule out cancer, you might want to get more than a four millimeter, maybe like a six, five millimeter punch. Uh, but just don't go into a center of an ulcer. Um, and that that plays true for if you're biopsying for autoimmune conditions as well. Uh, the center of the ulcer will not get you a diagnosis because we have to see how the epithelium is interacting with the connective tissue. And I can already tell this group knows enough to know that an ulcer means lack of epithelium. So mm -hmm. it's nice to talk to people who know my language. Yay. Um, one person did ask what's the weirdest or, you know, strangest lesion you've ever seen. Well, I mean, so I see a lot of, I see a lot of cancer. Mm -hmm. And when I went to do my like interviews for residency, all the residents were running around like, oh my gosh, everybody look at this great cancer. And I just thought I never want to be that pathologist, right? Because there's a human being attached to the other side of that. But I've been doing this for so long now that it's, it's easier to dissociate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to, because I diagnose cancer every single day. Mm -hmm. um, so probably the weirdest case is I got an amelanotic melanoma. Um, it was, it looked like an, an ulcer on the maxilla. That's where they like to live. No pigment whatsoever. We had to diagnose it based on immunohistochemical stains, but it's hard to get excited about that, right? Because that patient's not going to do well. Mm -hmm. um, so my personal favorite lesion that I've seen um, is there's called uh, a juxta or organ, I'm going to say this wrong, of Chevette's. My mentors would murder me. And it's usually in the retromolar pad. And that's the only place it lives. And I saw it on the tongue once. And it's there's only been like five reports of it ever. So that was probably my favorite because it's benign. Yeah. So I, I tend to prefer benign things. Benign and rare. So you kind of made a history but, book. In benign the and rare. I had to yeah. send a, a picture of it to my friends and they're like, oh, it's organ of Chevette's. And I'm like, yeah, it's on the tongue. It's not that. Um, so I, you know, showed it around enough to where we figured out what it was. I, I didn't know off the bat, but I figured it out. So your group text messages must be on, must be fire. Like, or the oh. oral path group. Man, we, it is. Uh, I had to mute it because we text so often every day, and it is purely nerd stuff. So, like, including, hey guys, look at this really cool case that I got. Here's the histopathology if you want it for your lectures, which, by the way, I never put histopathology in my lectures because I just assume normal people don't care. So, <laughs> so uh, when, um, should I just lost those? I forgot. I totally lost the question? train of thought because I'll jump in. Yeah, you jump in. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to that train of thought. Go ahead. All right. So, um, I actually posted this case through Ignite DDS last week, which we do a, we're doing a co-project with them. And it was a case, it was a squamous case that had been biopsied since 2017. And when you look at the pictures, you would be blown away that it kept getting a benign diagnosis because it was a white leukoplakia lesion going all the way across the attached gingiva of the maxillary. Oh, it's a PBL case then. 
Correct. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Because the crazy thing about that is he had four biopsies, different locations each time. I didn't perform any of them. One was through the VA. A couple were through oral surgeons. All came back benign. I kept pushing and I said, uh, I don't think this is benign because you're not giving me any kind of diagnosis. The fifth biopsy pinged squamous cell. He lost the maxillary arch from number 11 posterior. And I think he's going to lose the upper right maxillary arch pretty soon. So PVL, I said the, the initials, PVL is proliferative verruca sucoplachia. And as soon as you said he got benign diagnoses and gingiva, I was like, it's PVL. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what happens with PVL. Um, PVL, uh, proliferative verruca sucoplachia, uh, when it first starts, is very benign looking, both clinically and microscopically. And I, it, I'm not trying, I'm trying to be very collegial here. Um, and I truly believe that they probably were benign when they were biopsied, but uh, PVL, the early stages mimic other things microscopically. And it is like the number one mistake I see if you don't send to an experienced oral pathologist, like maybe you're sending to a head and neck pathologist who like if you're at the VA, who doesn't yeah. see this often, it just looks like hyperkeratosis. And it right. looks like lichen planus actually sometimes. Um, so these cases, I've had three patients now that were misdiagnosed with lichen planus, but really they had PVL because it looks similar. Um, but if you're an oral pathologist, you know that and you know it's on the gingiva and you know to tell the clinician like, hey, if these lesions aren't moving around, coming and going, changing patterns. If it's leukoplakia, this is PVL. And PVL has a 100% malignant transformation rate. So pretty much without treatment. So pretty much everyone with PVL, if they're left alone, they go on to get cancer. Um, and like I said, I've had three patients misdiagnosed with like implantis and they were given steroids to put on their precancerous mm -hmm. lesions. Um, they all three ended up getting cancer by the time that they were, they were to me, uh, one, uh, wanted to see the number one person who treats PVL that I could think of. Uh, she was down in Texas and, you know, the surgeon down in Texas, it's so rare that our number one surgeon only had 10 cases. So I found an oral pathologist in North Carolina, uh, Dr. Padilla, mm -hmm. uh, shout out to Dr. Padilla. So I referred, uh, he went to those same residencies I did. So I referred this patient to him and unfortunately she's a dentalist now, but he has prevented her from getting cancer. Um, the average time it takes to turn into cancer is eight years. And she was mismanaged for 14 years before she got to me. So the fact that he's been able to prevent her from getting cancer has just been incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say, um, just any like if I could anything on the gingiva, uh, we don't really think of that as a place where we get cancer because it's keratinized. We usually get it on lateral tongue, ventral tongue, floor, mouth. But um, don't overlook those gingival lesions that aren't responding to appropriate therapy. So go ahead and clinically diagnose this as diagnose things as what you think it is. But if it's not responding to therapy, so if you're thinking it's like implantis, but it's not going away with steroids then we need to rethink our, our diagnosis um, and biopsy it. And then another thing that I would just hammer down is um, please send to someone who sends to oral path. Like if you aren't doing your own biopsies, um, I don't want to say don't send to ENT because there's a lot of insurance considerations there. So a lot of people refer these biopsies to ENT, but then the issue is oral pathologists aren't seeing uh, the slide and oral pathologists, it's just a fact we're better trained at oral pathology. Like I have learned, you know, I had kidneys on my board, but I, I do not want to sign out kidney cases. You know what I mean? So it's not an insult. They're better at head and neck than I am. Um, but just, we see more oral, so it ought to go to oral pathology. So and Asha, when you said he was, he was, the Dr. Padilla was able to prevent the cancer in that case. I mean, what, what does treatment look like in a case like that? I mean, what, what are the, the therapeutic avenues there? So for patients with PVL, uh, there's been some experimental therapies, but the only thing we know for sure works is repeated surgeries and repeated laserings. 
And the thing with PVL is it has almost a hundred percent recurrence rate. So you've got this area of leukoplakia, you laser it off six months later, it comes right back. So it's important to be judicious with how often you're lasering these patients. Um, so what I prefer to do is wait until to my eye, it looks dysplastic. Um, and I'm, you know, you said that, uh, d differential diagnosis is hard and, and treating teeth is easy. And I feel the opposite, right? Because I don't ever treat teeth. So I think that sounds really very difficult. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. but I, I know enough to know like, okay, this one is probably it's time to go, but I also work with the patient. Um, and their preferences. So this patient wanted to be very aggressive because she hadn't been treated properly for uh, 14 years. She already had a severe dysplasia. So she basically got her whole mouth lasered. Um, the PVL tends to crawl around the roots of the teeth. We call it like a ring around the collar. Uh, Don Cohen at University of Florida came up with that. And so that's bad because the leukoplakia can crawl into the cravicular epithelium where you can't see it. So Dr. Padilla and she decided they extracted all maxillary teeth. This was appropriate therapy, but it was aggressive. Um, and I probably would have done the same thing if I were in her situation, frankly. Um, but, you know, she's like 45 years old, 50 years old. So it's, and her teeth were fine. It's just that she had this massive PVL lesion. Um, and she goes to see him like once every three months and her residents, you know, I asked him at a, at a meeting, a national meeting for pathology, like how she was doing. And all the residents like knew her name and knew her so well. And this was like a real success story for them because she, the goal for her is I don't want cancer. And so far she's, that goal has been achieved. So, so this is, it's funny that Jennifer brought that case up because I lost my train of thought and it's exactly what her case was. My question was, is that you sometimes see these things that are, benign but they still aren't necessary you're you're still not necessarily out of the woods because aren't there certain issues that can occur with benign uh tumors neoplasms whatever that can still create problems but they can also there are certain ones that can become malignant too so how do how does a dentist say okay well, you know uh, you know a lot of people just walk away and say oh it's benign I'm good. You know, yeah. I don't know so, that that's really the case. So that's, you know, I've seen some GPs get in trouble with that where they do a biopsy and it's moderate dysplasia and they say it's not cancer. So yes. they don't do anything about it. But really the treatment should be that all that tissue has to come out. You can't just leave it there. Um, and in the case of PVL, it's, it's the one that is most haunting because if I suspect that this might be a lesion of PV, PVL, I can't tell by what it's doing on the microscope. It has to be the clinician because it's a clinical diagnosis, but I will always, I, I don't like to put comments on my diagnoses because I don't like to tell people how to treat things. I think the clinicians know better than I do. You're seeing the patient, but for PVL cases, I will always say this looks like PVL. If there are multiple spots, this patient probably has PVL kind of thing. You know, I'll, I'll wordsmith it a little bit better, but um as far as benign hyperkeratosis goes, that needs to be followed every six months for 20 years. And if it grows, if it changes in any way, it has to be re-biopsied because then the diagnosis has changed. And that's something that I wasn't taught in school, that it that hyperkeratosis needs to be followed that closely. I was under the impression, now I shouldn't say that's not what I was taught. What I picked up from the... <laughs> from my professors was in dental school was that hyperkeratosis is totally benign. Don't worry about it. And subsequently I used to teach that to my dental students and that is incorrect. Um, the real thing we should do is recognize that if something is true leukoplakia, even if it's just hyperkeratosis, that has potential of turning into cancer and it ought to be watched every six months for 20 years. So let me bring this, I, I just, I, I want to bring this into real world, especially for people, well, actually all three of us who live in areas where chewing tobacco and, and dipping is just so commonplace. And so, I mean, literally almost, you know, th there are certain groups that live in my area 
that all have it. I'm never going to talk them out of dipping. They all have that hyperkeratosis around where they put the dip. And so it, it's always a hard decision at where do you say, okay, we're going to watch this, but at some point I'm going to have to take a biopsy here. And, and is that a case for brush biopsy? Is that a good indication? Or do we say, look, I, I mean, I can only watch this for so long before I take the scalpel blade out. You know, mm -hmm. what, what, are, what is the right thing to do there and, and the right course of action? That's a really interesting point because as you know, I like I said, I've talked to you all for like an hour and I already know that like your level is up here. Um, as you know, it's not very carcinogenic, smokeless tobacco. So the relative risk of someone getting a cancer from smokeless tobacco is 1.2 to 1. So me having never used, I have a 1 risk, they have 1.2. Statistically, those numbers aren't different. Um, so it is a risk, but it's a very minor risk. Now, what the literature says to do is to biopsy it when it starts to look bad. And it's that's so subjective. It is totally so subjective. I went in and I it was looks, like, it looks bad day one. Yeah. So I was like, what does that mean? What does yeah. bad mean? And it is if you have sharply defined borders. So smokeless tobacco keratosis is a frictional keratosis. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the fissures don't matter. The, the white is what's concerning. The fissures are from like literally just placing something in your vestibule and then it wrinkles. Um, so those probably won't go away in a long-term user. Um, but the white, because it's frictional, should sort of feather off at the sides. And if you have something where you're like, that's where the white ends, that's where normal begins, that ought to be biopsied because that's true leukoplakia. If you palpate it and it feels hard like a rock, that ought to be biopsied. If it's ulcerated, it ought to be biopsied. And here's the subjective one. If it's thick, it ought to be biopsied. So I hadn't really thought about that might hardly ever do I see dysplasia in smokeless tobacco keratosis. And if I do, and I live in Kentucky and, you know, I lived in West Virginia before, in, well, I lived in Texas and then I left in West Virginia for that. So I've seen my fair share of these, these uh, tobacco pouches. Um, I hardly ever see dysplasia in them, but if it is dysplastic, it's usually mild. So mm -hmm. the, that is an interesting thought of maybe this is a patient that could benefit from a brush biopsy um, because, you know, brush biopsies have over 90% sensitivity and specificity. So they can tell you, yeah, we ought to be worried about this or no, we're okay for now. So that that's really interesting. I mean, I recommend a scalpel biopsy just because we want to get a diagnosis um, and you could do it honestly for any patient that you wanted to. Anytime you felt uncomfortable, you could recommend a biopsy. Um, but usually I just watch them. There's, but it, so you, there's a more. difference though, right? Because I see this every day and yeah. for someone who doesn't see it all the time or isn't as familiar with it, if I was a GP, I'd probably be sitting a lot for biopsy that didn't need it. Well, guys, we are out of time. That flew by. Yeah, that really did fly. Uh, that went by so quickly. I would love to do like a program with you, Ashley. I could sit here and just ask you questions about clinical relevance because you know that's where people learn so much is saying okay here's what we see on our side relate it to what you're getting in the tube when we goof it up with the laser or you know or, or yeah. do the wrong yeah. thing on our end so um we just appreciate you taking the time to to do this and we appreciate um we appreciate your your presence in education because Absolutely. It's mm -hmm. such an important piece. And I think so few, you know, again, it's just, it's not the glitz and the glamour of dentistry, but it is the most needed thing in dentistry. So we just really appreciate what you're doing and the fact that you're willing to share that with so many. So um, thanks for being on. We are absolutely going to have you back and um, we're going to drop you down. We're going to close out the show, but Thank you again. Like literally, I want to have you on every other show. So. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Jen, for uh, for having me. Uh, so oh my gosh, good to it was so again. much we'll fun. I things. could have gone on for hours. So yeah. I'm on my last little bit, so I had to call it. <laughs>
And there it's, you go. It's, it's it's not an energy drink, just to clarify. Oh, thanks, Ashley. Have All a good right, night. Thank Ashley. you. Night. All right. All so, right. One uh, of the two, you want to close it? What? Well, do one of the two of you want to close it? I'll close us out just to shut JB down. I mean, she does the news. You open us up. I should probably close us out, right? I think that's yeah. fair. So uh, I just want to give a special thanks to all of our viewers tonight. We had a very special viewer tonight, uh, Mark Benford from Avalon Biomed. Uh, great uh, friend of the show. And uh, hopefully we'll get to talk to Mark in the next week or so. Uh, Dr. Wyatt, Ryan Walsh had some pretty amazing questions regarding uh, punch biopsies, scalpels, lasers, all kinds of stuff. It was a great show. I really enjoyed it. I would like to thank our sponsor of the show, Q Optics. They've just been a great partner of our show. And I'd like to thank you two for the time with you, as always, every always. week. And of course, Dr. Ashley Clark, what an amazing presenter. I'm like, I, I could have spent two hours on that easy. And then I would have fallen asleep. We're really lucky to have her in the profession for sure. Yeah, we are. And I, I definitely want to have her back because I wanted to talk about a certain neoplasm that we didn't even get to. So anywho, that's it for this week, folks. We'll see y'all next week. Everybody have a fantastic week. Keep trucking on and really appreciate you guys. Y'all take care. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. up another podcast for dentists in the know on behalf of dr jennifer bell dr chad duplantis and myself remember that we've got a great profession so let's make it a great day dinks